Hi, this is Keith, and welcome to Klezmer Podcast 84. The website is klezmerpodcast.com, and you can write to me at keith at klezmerpodcast.com. On this episode of the podcast, I have an interview with Yiddish singer Jeff Berner from Vancouver, Canada. He was in Los Angeles recently for a show at uh, Genghis Cohen, and he has a new album out entitled Victory Party. I caught up with Jeff before his show, and here's my interview with Jeff Berner at Genghis Cohen. Hi, this is Keith, and uh, with Klezmer Podcast, visiting with Jeff Berner live at Genghis Cohen in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Jeff? Hi. Welcome to Klezmer Podcast. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. We're uh, live, uh, you're from Vancouver, British Columbia, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know why, but it's raining outside right now. Did you bring some rain with you? Yes, I, I did actually. I put it in the trunk and I brought it out. It kind of follows me wherever I go. It's a great thing for the farmers. <laughs> it is. Actually, we could use some rain here in Los Angeles, so uh, we, we don't mind it at all. Is this the first rain in six months or something like that? I think so. I think, it's, I think it is. That's crazy. <laughs> but besides the weather, we're here to talk Jewish music. So, uh, is it your first time performing in Los Angeles? No, I played here playing uh, opening for a guy named Jason Webley on his Monsters of Accordion tour a couple <laughs> of years ago. That was pretty fun. There's four accordionists on the on the road together. That was pretty good. Cool. Okay. Well. You have a new album out called Victory Party, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I just want to get a sense of uh, your music background and uh, your approach to the music, because it's it's not your standard uh, uh, Jewish-Yiddish uh, repertoire. No, that's true. Um, I began as a kind of punk rock kid, and uh, I was doing singer-songwriter stuff with the accordion, solo and I was running into a lot of people who were friends of mine who were doing country what they were calling alt country where they they did they kind of married their punky rockiness with the music of their roots a lot of these guys had grown up on farms and stuff and and uh, so they made but they wound up making uh, country music that was very gutsy and to me kind of authentic, more authentic or whatever so I, I, my initial impulse was to try to like bring that approach to Jewish music and since that was my heritage to, that I should give that a go kind of thing and then uh, it was really through finding a song by Denai Capella Bob Cohen's band and Yonko's band uh, on a compilation, that's when uh, I knew that if I was going to try to figure that out, I had to find Bob Cohen. <laughs> Go to the source. <laughs> yeah, and so I wrote him a fan letter, and uh, I asked him. If we, I told him that me and my band were coming over to uh, to Eastern Europe. Or to Europe for a tour and could we maybe hang out with him in Budapest and he said well I won't be around because I'm going to be doing some ethnomusicological traveling in the wilds of the Romania just finding old Roma guys who used to play in the klezmer bands before the war in the little villages and stuff so I won't be able to hang out with you he said so I just said, uh, do you need somebody to drive you around? <laughs> and, and he let us drive him around. He told us that the last people who had tried to be klezmer tourists with him in that part of Romania had had to be fl- medevaced out on a stretcher out of, <laughs> for pure madness and <laughs> horror. But we... Uh, we stuck it out with him and drove him around and listened to him talk and found these old guys with him and that was where our journey really began with the 
trying to find I'm always trying to find a way in to make Jewish culture make sense for me now um, and I take different approaches to that um, but in the end what I wind up doing mostly is writing new Jewish Canadian drinking songs <laughs> I think that's great well because it, it does run the gamut from what I would consider pretty traditional um, to more on the punk side so it, and it, it's a pretty broad spectrum and you seem to get both ends of that spectrum right I really appreciate you saying that I mean I just kind of let the muse roam and see where we wind up and uh, um, big part of the sound of the new record is is Josh Dolgan who performs as so-called he's a he really helped us get the sound to, that we needed on on the to go forward on the next record and uh, Who's your clarinet player on there? Because the clarinet was really good. Well, Michael Winograd is uh, my course. favorite. He's currently my favorite uh, clarinet, klezmer clarinet player, or clarinet player, period. Uh, he's a wonderful man, and he's able to, when we drag ourselves down into the ditch, he's able to go there with us, despite the fact that he has, you know, insane chops as a musician. So. And he, so he and his pal Benji Fox Rosen, who plays the bass on the record, sure. they're a big factor in the it. dynamic duo. Yeah, <laughs> the, Benji's going to be putting out a record with uh, on John Zorn's label pretty soon. So he's a he's a going concern, you know. Yeah, he, he's a big force on the on the scene. Yeah, his his uh, Yiddish knowledge is really uh, astonishing and impressive, and I'm jealous of it. <laughs> and who's the, you have a female vocalist uh, as well, Who, who's that? Well, let's see, we have my violin, the other violinist, Diona Davies, sings on the record, but in addition to that, we did a version of My Neruda Platz, which, where we had a verse translated into Mandarin Chinese, because <laughs> it just seemed like a love song from, from the sweatshops, if it was to be up to date that it should be part of it at least should be sung in Chinese you know uh, <laughs> especially given the fact that I'm from Vancouver it's my hometown and and Vancouver is you know nearing like 40% uh, Chinese population at this point so it's a big part of of our heritage as a city as well sure and that that song I noticed from listening today um, is probably the most traditional song you have on there, and that, that's an a, a, an existing song, right? You, yeah, I think is the name of the poet is Morris Rosenfeld, but now now I, it, for some reason it's jumped out of my head. I think that's correct, but I'll have to look it up on the. But I'm sure that's it. Um, and uh, he was an actual. Yiddish poet in who worked in those in those factories in the early 20th century, and uh, he uh, I believe he also wrote the melody, and uh, it's a classic for sure. Many people have recorded it. Now let's sh shift a little bit from the from the uh, classic uh, Yiddish stuff to some of the uh, the more punkish. Stuff the the uh, the first track I, I can't remember the the full name the, the, with the police uh, oh oh police the police saying. one oh yeah. the lawyer police say yeah well that is also based on traditional melodies and songs the lawyer police say means down with the police and it was sung in the streets of Russia in in the rev first revolution of 1905 and elsewhere and. Uh, it was it was a call for a regicide. Actually, it was a, it, part of one of the verses. Actually, called for the murder of the czar. <laughs> so it was a pretty <laughs> hardcore song uh, in its original form, and I just updated it to talk about police murder in uh, in, in contemporary Canada. But I would encourage anyone else who is going to play it to uh, 
adapt it by writing a second verse, a middle verse, uh, about police murder from their own city. Since it's, it's fairly reliable that you could find a, a case where where a policeman killed with impunity in almost any city in the world, it's a it's a kind of a good folk trope to put, <laughs> put your local your local police murder in there. You know, everybody's got one, right? Yeah, it seems <laughs> like it. Um, uh, along those lines, the other one of the other songs I found interesting was uh, called "Jail." Oh yeah, which uh, not coincidental that it has to do with law enforcement themes, but <laughs> yeah, in, in this case, it, it, it it's uh, singing about the benefits of being in jail. It's a very silly song. <laughs> uh, it's a cover of a Toronto punk band uh, from ten years ago called Slatarded. <laughs> and but we've adapted it to try to make it a more a Jewish sounding klezmery version, uh, including uh, ripping off a bit of a Hungarian Jewish wedding melody uh, in there, and uh, so it's a definitely a bastard child song. But we really enjoy playing it live, so it's pretty. I'm it's, sure. I, the the line I like, and I don't know if I if I've got it right, but um, I want to go to jail so I can get a pair of shoes. Get a new pair of shoes. Yeah, I don't know if you always get a new pair when you go to jail, <laughs> but you do. They do give you shoes, so it's very. It's a it's a goofy song. It makes more sense, really, uh, being in the context of it being sung by Deona Davies, who really would be fine in jail. <laughs> I wouldn't be, make sense for me to sing it. Um, so, uh, uh, are any of these songs actually uh, completely original? I, I, the ones I, I, I mentioned already that I think are original, you're already you've are covers from other other songs already. Well, I, but um, is is there some stuff you're doing from scratch? Because everything on the album sounds really great, you know, to begin with. Well, I really admire. Uh, uh, Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan's magpie approach of like t grabbing bits of pieces from different things and throwing them together and, uh, and but uh, there are a few that that where I where it's less identifiable where uh, where I rip things off from and stuff I mean the title track Victory Party uh, or um, the last song Cherry Blossoms or uh, the song uh, uh, "Wealthy Poet." There's not anything in particular I can think of that I that I ripped off for that, <laughs> except for the the rhythm is the rhythm that my dog drank water at. He would be able to do 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 do. He would drink lap 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 lap, and that turns out to be in seven eight. <laughs> so I didn't know that. It's perfect. Yeah. It's a, a dog must have been Eastern European. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so, it uh, looks like you, tonight you're performing a, a solo act? Yeah. I try to... Uh, I've done, I, I, wrote, I play about half the time solo, and uh, my life was really changed when I was a kid, and I saw... Billy Bragg perform, when, and he would almost always be solo, and he uh, he would introduce the song in a funny way, and then he'd interrupt himself in the middle of the song, and and if someone shouted something from the audience, he'd shout something back at them, and then he'd tell stories about ludicrous things that happened to him on tour, <laughs> and and it it was a a complete singer-songwriter troubadour experience with with anger and humor and love songs and politics and it really changed the way I th it changed my politics as a teenage kid and it changed uh, the way I thought about what, how you could perform solo and so I kind of aspire to that style to be a part of that. It's a lot of work to do a solo act. Well, you don't have anybody to, to, to take a solo for you or something. 
yeah, you really, uh, you you really stuck. And if you, if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. <laughs> you can't just kind of glide through the wrongness. You're just, it's just you and your accordion. And uh, but uh, if it goes right, it's kind of magic because it people are amazed that they could be entertained by just this guy yelling at them with the accordion in his hand. So it's, <laughs> it's there, there's you know the currency of drama is risk so there's a great deal of dramatic currency in the solo performer deal because they can people can tell that I'm also afraid of how it's going to go <laughs> so, yeah. it's not 100 percent guaranteed then no it could go it, sometimes the magic works and <laughs> sometimes it doesn't it could go either way um well, let's just talk about uh, your music background for a second. Um, you're playing accordion. Uh, how did you decide on accordion, or have you played other instruments as well? Uh, I played piano. Uh, I can kind of play guitar if it's tuned in open G. Um, but uh, I was piano player. And my friends were guitar players, and they came to a party with a big hat full of chain. Of well, they came with booze that they had bought with a half full of change and uh, and uh, I was angry at them for uh, being able to make money with just going out on the street and so I threatened them with uh, taking up the accordion and I was like I'll show you I'll get an accordion and go in front of the liquor store and then and then somebody just handed me an accordion they said well my grandfather left this and just here in the house, you can have it, and because uh, it was like when I started in the '90s, the the accordion in North America was really uh, a really a spat upon instrument. You know, people really. <laughs> the, the, I could, I they could, were giving them away to random people on the street. Really, there, and you could step <laughs> on stage in a rock and roll club, and people would would make for the door right away before you'd even played a note just on, on the count of their prejudice against the accordion and this for me was a tremendous uh, as, a, as a punk rock kid this was like really felicitous like I could before I would even play I could begin a confrontation with the audience <laughs> and and make them sick you know which was and I knew I was on the right track, you know. The accordion is a kind of a misunderstood instrument, huh? Especially in North America, less so in Europe, where it never really fully went away, you know. But here, it was almost complete. The uh, I guess it's partly because of uh, Lawrence Welk and stuff like that. People just saw it as the height of unhipness, you know. So. Uh, and, and they lost any kind of notion of it as a romantic um, instrument, so or or its any of its potential for evoking darkness or or exoticism or any of the other fun things that it can actually do. You know, people kind of forgot about it. Really, in, I think until the uh, mid '80s. Uh, Tom Waits records, you know, when they that's when it started to make a comeback, maybe a little bit. Even the world out, word Al Yankovic. Yeah, well, I mean, he was really, in a way, I mean, this might be a, it's a bit extreme, but he was kind of what he did with the accordion was in a, in a sense like. Um, exploiting ethnic self hatred, you know. <laughs> He was he was mocking himself as a as a pole in a way, you know, by bringing out the accordion and playing the kind of melodies that his grandparents might have enjoyed at the kitchen table, and making a big joke about it. That it it was amusing, but at the same time, there was something kind of sad about that, you know. Right, but. People started listening to accordion again. 
Yeah, they started to get the... Get even even uh, if it was uh, uh, as a joke, but people started listening anyway. That's true, you know, that's a good point. Yeah, and he's a the guy who can play the accordion much better than I can, of course. Brilliant player. Well, we'll see about that uh, soon. <laughs> I, I certainly don't claim to be a, an accordion virtuoso, you know. I'd say that, uh, I don't know who I would be would compare myself to exactly, but, you know, I, I try to kind of play accordion the way that Keith Richards plays guitar, you know, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't pack a lot of super fast arpeggios into his playing, and he doesn't uh, do anything where you go, geez, how'd he do that? He, <laughs> it's just the feet, he's got that feel, and he's got, he knows where to put the dissonant bits and stuff like that. So that's what I'm trying for on the accordion. That's great. Well, um, anything else uh, you want? Oh, I know. Tell everybody uh, how they can contact you, how they can find your uh, information, uh, and where they can buy your album or download the tracks. Well, they should just punch my name into their search engine and all the stuff will come up. Um, my name is Go, spelled kind of funny. Uh, it's G E O F F, and then B E R N E R. And so my website's www.jeffburner.com. But really, if you just punch me into any of your machines, uh, stuff will come up. You know. Great. Uh, so go to jeffburner.com. The album is called Victory, Victory Party. Party. Yep. So pick it up, download it, and enjoy it. It's uh, it's coming for me. I got to say, it's very different, and you've got to listen to Jeff Burner. Thanks very much. Thanks for being on Closer Podcast, Jeff. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. Jeff was also kind enough to perform a tune exclusively for Klezmer Podcast. So here we go with his version of The Lady Diana. This is a poem by Soy Korolenko that Daniel Kahn and Soy translated. I believe that they're calling the song The Lady Diana. There once was a Lady Diana She loved a guy from Indiana And there was a lady named Hannah And she loved a guy from Montana And there was a lady named Marion And she loved an octogenarian And there was a lady named Pearl And she was in love with a Squirrel. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does this song really mean? The song's about love, the song's about dreams, the song is about you and me. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does this song really mean? The song's about love, the song's about dreams. The song is about you and me And there was a lady named Terry She used to love the tooth fairy And there was a lady named Lauren And she was in love with a moron And there was a lady named Nana She loved a young entertainer And there An old vacuum cleaner. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does this song really mean? The song's about hope. The song's about faith. The song is about good old days. What does it mean? What does it mean? What could this possibly mean? The song's about hope. Songs about faith, the song is about foolish ways. And there was a lady named Annabelle. 
She was in love with a cannibal And there was a small man named Sue And he loved the cannibal too And there was a lady named Susan And she was in love with her cousin And there was a lady named Annie And she used to love Susan's granny what does it mean? What does it mean? What does this song really mean? The cavalry road, the prodigal soul, the place where we all have to be. What does it mean? What does it mean? What could this possibly mean? A funeral pyre, an eternal fire, and those who are weeping for me A song of old friends and relations Of distances and separations A song of our tender embraces And sad bitter tears on our faces A song of our torments and pains Of unending long distance trains God was truly unknown. Hi, this is Ilana Kravitz from the London Klezmer Quartet in London, UK, and you're listening to klezmerpodcast.com. So that's about it for Klezmer Podcast 84. Again, the website is klezmerpodcast.com. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or if you have a band that would like to appear on the podcast or have your music played, or if you have a recent or soon-to-be-released album you'd like me to review, please write to me at keith at klezmerpodcast.com. Again, as a reminder, the music heard on Klezmer Podcast is for promotional purposes only and is used with permission. So that's about it for Klezmer Podcast 84. Thanks for listening. Please stay subscribed. Tell your friends. And until next time, bye for now.